First of all, welcome to everybody. Uh, this is our seminar series on building resilience in food and health supply chains. And it's uh, organized by Professor Beck, uh, Tracy, Gallery, uh, Tracy Galloway, uh, Ryan Isaacson, Michael Weiner, and myself. And we uh, all come from different disciplinary perspectives. So that's what makes, I think, this seminar series very interesting. So. Uh, today, we're very thrilled to welcome Professor Steve Thomas from Trinity College Dublin, and I'll just tell you a little bit about his background. He's the director of the Center for Health Policy and Management at the Edward Kennedy Chair of, and, and the Edward Kennedy Chair of Health Policy and Management, and he's also the co-director of the National Sphere Program in Population Health and Health Services Research. Um, he has over 25 years of international policy experience and education and works a lot with government and academia and you'll, you'll see that in his talk today, and he has a long track record of influencing policy. Uh, he collaborates widely with national and international stakeholders and most recently led a policy brief for the World Health Organization labeled Strengthening Health Systems Resilience, and he's going to talk to us about that today. So very warm welcome all the way from Dublin, uh, Professor Thomas, where it's uh, eight, after eight o'clock at night, so very much appreciate you taking the time to uh, join us today and have a conversation about health system resilience. Thank you so much, Laura, and thank you everyone uh, uh, to, for, for having me present from my bedroom rather than bringing me to, to Toronto. Actually, it could be worse. My, my wife had to do a, a presentation to a conference in Mexico last week, and she had to do hers at 10.30 at night. So I actually get the, the long straw. So I'm doing uh, very well here. But I was actually over in, in Toronto a couple of years back. Um, I think your colleagues, uh, Professor Greg uh, Marshall Dern and Professor Sarah Allen invited me over to do a talk and, and, and I had a, a lovely time, such a lovely time. I, I, I wanted to do some sabbatical uh, last year over in Toronto and then COVID cut that out. But what Toronto taught me was, was what the real definition of cold is. Uh, Toronto in March. It was absolutely brutal. And in fact, on the second day, I was all togged up with my suit and tie and I wore my PJs underneath. I was that cold, you know, so so that's the similarity between uh, today and two years ago today. I can wear my PJs on the, on the bottom half and you'll never know whether I'm making that up or not. Anyway, so let's talk about health system uh, resilience. It's very much the the topic, the the mode du jour, the the the, the trending issue, um, and I've been involved with with research in health system resilience probably over about um, ooh, I'd say about twelve years now, um, dating back to some of the austerity issues. So I'm going to get uh, going now. I'll tell you about the, what I'm going to talk about. Looking really to start off thinking about global vulnerability, the increasing global vulnerability to shocks, and, and my focus is primarily on shocks. Um, there are other manifestations of health system resilience that relate to what's called everyday re resilience, just the general give and take in, in a healthcare system. And some other people look at things like uh, aging and multimorbidity as stressors in the system. I'm not really going to be doing that. I am actually doing genuine shocks. You know, so sort of like climate events or things like that. Uh, and then I'll be looking at some initial thinking I did around health system resilience around 10 years ago, and particularly how that how that interplayed with the economic crisis. And then more recently, I sat back again and sort of did some more reflections on that and said, actually, that's not quite the whole picture. So I did some new thinking, and that's where the European Observatory Policy Brief came up. And we'll look at, look, um, at, at some of those ideas, and particularly in relation to COVID, which is in essence a mega shock. It's not just an, even a, a normal shock. And then we'll do some reflections and learning off the back of that. So hopefully that should take me about three and a half hours, and uh, we'll be good. Uh, okay, so I think what's interestingly what's interesting about the 21st century is the increasing prevalence of shocks that are coming at us from every direction, partly I think through some of the choices uh, we've made historically, partly through our, our globalized world. And I would take health system shocks as any sudden or extreme change which will impact on our health system. And you know, you probably know, know this territory quite well, health emergencies, epidemics, disasters, economic crisis, conflict, mass migration, terrorism attacks, which presents you with a, quite a huge challenge. How do you make the health system resilient to all of that? Because uh, uh, so, they're quite different things. 
And the way I like to think about uh, health system resilience, because I'm an economist, so I always I have to apologize for being an, an economist, and, and people always think that's quite funny. But there we go. Uh, I am an, an economist, and, and the way I see it is that actually the shock causes a profound disturbance to the balance of supply of and demand for healthcare services. So one of the issues that, that you raise in, in your, in your uh, lecture series is the, is the supply uh, chain issues. Well, actually, I think it's the supply chain issues and the demand side uh, impacts as well. So, so it's kind of a, like a double whammy coming at you. And then you have to manage all those things within what is a complex system. So in essence, therefore, quite unpredictable in some ways. Um, and interestingly here, I think we it, it's important to think that actually different shocks have different causal pathways. How they influence the health sector is quite distinct and therefore you need to know what you're dealing with. So for instance, with the, an, an economic crash, we have a profound resource contraction because governments don't have the, 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 the resources, the tax base has, has kind of eroded, whatever it is. So they can't supply as many resources. But at the same time, the households experience a loss of purchasing power and particularly where there are financial barriers to care, then they can't get the care from you know either, they can't afford it. So, so that's, that's the sort of economic crash uh, sort of pathways with an epidemic you have a massive need expansion and as we're learning that's not just around the disease itself but it's around other associated needs for instance mental health um, but at the same time you have the secondary impact which is that the human resources are then constrained uh, so you get human resources healthcare professional not only contracting uh, the particular, uh, whatever it is, uh, ep epidemic, but having to isolate too. So again, there's a sort of demand side impact, supply side impact, and that plays out in different ways towards your provision of, of healthcare. And I also put mass migration down here because I think this is quite an interesting one. And this comes a little bit out of the uh, experience of the Lebanon uh, of uh, Lebanon with the Syrian war. And what we actually saw there was a massive need expansion as, as people migrated into into uh, Lebanon, so there's a huge increase for demand for healthcare services. But actually, if managed properly, there was a the, there was a release of uh, of of a, of a supply side boost to that by having potential uh, additional human resources brought in, additional healthcare professionals, and additional tax re resources where people were able to be um, integrated into the economy. So it doesn't always have to be necessarily negative, but there are distinct, I think, pathways that are coming through different shocks. And I was involved with the uh, European Union Health System um, Performance Assessment Working Group uh, for the last few years, thinking about health systems resilience. And we did we did a survey of EU health system experts in July 2019. So this is six months before COVID really made its mark. And we asked people, well, what are you actually worried about? What are you preparing for? What are you thinking about? What's exercising your 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 planning and interestingly enough and correctly perhaps we saw epidemiological shocks were top although i don't think anyone quite got the covid um but you know that 90 percent of, of 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 health systems that was a key concern environmental shocks came second economic shocks came third but as you can see there's quite a wide range of different concerns so again health system resilience is understood and interpreted and planned for perhaps in quite different ways which which perhaps gives us a challenge really about how we how we kind of synthesize all this learning um so we turn to the issue of health system resilience what actually is it is it just about just keeping going in the face of stuff uh, and that's yes it is but it's that's kind of like too too broad and we can't really use that because we have to be academics and we have to publish papers off the back of this and make it useful so so we need to think things a little bit more precisely i'm actually not too worried about it i think there is growing specificity uh and and and, and i think that's partly because people are just spending a little more time with the, the concept than they have done previously it's quite a new concept really in a in a health system context and the parallels i would draw would be with the economic notion of efficiency which has like spiraled off into lots of different particular definitions and i think probably resilience will will do so uh, as well as long as we're clear about what kind of health system resilience that we're talking about then then that, that's useful the thing that i it's not about is bouncing back and that that back concept of bouncing back irritates me 
because this is we're dealing with a complex system we can't possibly get back to where we are before um you know a, a shock changes us profoundly uh in many ways it creates legacy issues and we're talking about that l later so so the new normal is not going to be like the old normal and and you know and obviously there's some there's some merit in that so so you know I, we can't go back and we probably don't want to uh, because there's plenty wrong with the previous health system anyway. So why would we try and, you know, put the sort of do a handbrake turn and get back there? So, you know, there's plenty to, to fix in every health system in the world. So my early thinking was really drawing on the socio-ecological uh, literature around extreme sort of climate ev uh, events and, and systems and how uh, populations and, and uh, societies adapt. So I initially took the idea that resilience is about your ability to uh, absorb, adapt and transform in the face of, 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 of a shock. So I took that as a general, uh, general idea. And then what I did uh, the early thinking uh, in, the, uh, in the, the resilience project, which was really all about Ireland and, and the austerity and the crisis, because Ireland had a you know, terrible crisis, as we'll, we'll, we'll look at just now, trying to see how to manage the health system through that particular problem. So I divided uh, the, the kind of the ideas of resilience into these three components. So the financial resilience, which is to do with absorption, you know, really, can you protect funds for the healthcare in the face of the economic crisis? The, uh, adaptive re resilience is if you can't do that, can you make do with less? In other words, can you can you still keep the system inherently the same while sacrificing while not sacrificing key priorities? And then, if not, can you transform? Can you can you change the, the system because it fundamentally can't work as is? So that would be the basic notion that I was looking at there. Uh, and in essence, you know, you've probably seen these YouTube clips, you've probably done it with your kids too, you've lined up lots of different dominoes, you've pushed one, and you've seen the whole thing go spiraling off. Uh, and this is the way I initially conceived, I now think of it differently, but I initially conceived of health system resilience as being like the domino. So you get the shock, can you absorb it? No, you can't, it, the domino falls over, you try and adapt, can you adapt? No, you can't and it falls over in, into transformation. Um, and that was a general idea to, to, to start with. And there was some evidence that that kind of pattern uh, was there, at least initially, I, I think, for, 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 for Ireland. But the other element, I think, that, that I was very aware of when thinking about this was actually it wasn't enough to look at the system response. You needed to look at the shock you needed to look at the dimensions of the shock and obviously the worse a shock is the the less likely it is that you're going to be resilient to it so one of the things that we were trying to to see and, and to do was international comparisons and it probably wasn't very fair to compare in different countries with different shocks about which were resilient and which not so and resilience is about that shock reaction and therefore you you, you know you, it comes back to the issue of what do you understand exactly what the shock is and, and how it, it works out? Okay, so I'm now going to look at uh, just populating some of those ideas and concepts uh, that, that we did through the, uh, the Celtic tiger collapse. Uh, we went from roaring tiger to drowned kitten uh, very, very quickly indeed. And we're going to look at the whole issue, the whole area of, of you know, what happened to the Irish healthcare system through that crisis. So, okay, so first of all, we hit the iceberg big time. Uh, our economy, the four key indicators here where we're comparing uh, Ireland's uh, rates with the, the, the rate for the, um, for the, I think it's the European Union. Uh, and and we, we started off with very high growth rates, top left there. You know, we were booming, fantastic, and it collapsed and we, we shrank in one year. I think it was about 9% contraction. Our mean debt levels, uh, top right, they were very healthy uh, through the, the, the Celtic boom, uh, about 25% of GDP that went up to 70% in very short order, eventually reached 120%. So we, and, and at, at that stage, we were, you know, we were, we were firmly in the grip of the IMF and the European Troika. So we were bailed out. We had a, an 80 billion, resc 80 billion euro rescue fund. So it was pretty serious. And the, kind of those kind of debt levels are often associated with, with kind of very low income uh, sort of countries that get into trouble. 
our general government deficit was, well, I think uh, at its worst was minus 18% because a lot of our uh, our tax on, on uh, consumption uh, or sales uh, collapsed completely. And then I mean unemployment rate almost overnight went from 6% to, to 12%, eventually peaking around 14, 15%. So we really did hit hit that hard uh the the crisis hard so we had quite a, uh, a brutal shock and it actually lasted it had, there was a duration that we had to go through six austerity budgets so there was plenty of time for for all that that shock to to reverberate through the health system and 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 because we were quite interested to look at well how severe is the shock because only then can we really make proper comparisons we developed a recession severity index looking at things like uh, GDP uh, loss, uh, unemployment rise, the duration of the, uh, of the GDP uh, contraction, and then the debt levels in terms of particular thresholds. Um, and we had the fourth worst. So we were fourth worst uh, after the Baltics in 2008, 2009. Had we done, had we taken a different time frame, it would have been different. Uh, later on, uh, Greece and Spain, obviously, and, and Portugal, the other bailout countries, as we used to call them, the pigs, um, would have would have also uh, come up quite high in this recession severity. So it's quite, we had quite a harsh um, uh, recession. So these these three graphs then just are illustrative of absorption, adaptation, and transformation. And I'm just going to just walk through these quickly. There's there's loads of stuff that we did on this. Uh, I put a link up earlier to the to the website that we developed for this project. There's loads of papers and analyses done. But the first one, the absorption, uh, is really we, what we were looking about. Is you know can uh, can the government protect the health sector? Can the government protect the funding of the health sector uh, and what we see here in in the top left is actually the government pushing the costs of access of care onto households so actually government wasn't absorbing it uh, and so what, what we see here is by 2014 and it, an extra 600 million of costs were being pushed onto households from what we should be previously covered by government and they were to do with things like uh, reduce free care uh, for certain parts of the proportion, so, so, so parts of the uh, population, new prescription charges, particularly on those uh, who, who actually previously have been getting free care. So that's like that's a bit like a tax on the homeless. That's that's pretty bad. Uh, increased inpatient charges, higher threshold for drug reimbursements, higher ED charges. So about 130 euro per person per year was pushed back onto households. So uh, that's obviously uh, illustrative of. Uh, of not not really absorbing. So there's a, a kind of a, an initial um, uh, tr attempt to try and to try and deal with it, but then once the, the severity of the crisis kicked in, it was like you know we need to just you know find the money somewhere and therefore push costs back on onto households. In terms of adaptation, uh, actually, what you can see here uh, in this in, in this chart is uh, the this is an uh, this looks like an an index from two thousand and eight, and we can see the decrease here in public in the public health budget and in the staffing. So resources going out, but actually we can see some of the activity levels going up. So um, particularly outpatient uh, attendance goes up with fewer resources. And actually day cases, there's a switch from inpatient days to day cases. So actually the system you know, adopts efficiencies and becomes more efficient. And we're starting in the hospital sector, at least, to do more with less. And which is a strange thing that, that there might actually be a shock dividend in this way, at least in terms of uh, in, the, in the, the, the short run, that there were if easy, easy if you, efficiencies and low hanging fruit to, to make. Now, unfortunately, that didn't persist. Um, and uh, and what, what, what you see about 2013 is that we ran out of room for those efficiencies and because we'd just been taking so much out and the system then started to do less with less then in terms of transformation on the bottom here we have six different policies that the government was keen to try and take forward in this time and you know, partly taking up uh, obama's line of never waste a good crisis uh, and we did a survey of, of public managers, public sector managers, to say, OK, you know, uh, about these six policy priorities, you know, how, uh, how, how, do you, how important do you think they are and how much time are you able to spend 
on, on them. And what we show here in, in this chart is actually there's quite a close uh, link between how much the government values a particular or how much it's perceived that the government values a particular policy and how much the individual values it. But then there's quite a discrepancy between that valuation and actually the time that they're able to give to it shown in the green here. So emergency department waiting is one where we all agree it's a very important thing but but actually the time and the capacity of the public sector was just so crowded out with dealing with the problems of the austerity years that they weren't actually able to bring that transformation forward and we see that actually quite critically across each of these six uh, priorities and in fact only one of them uh, got through and that was the formation of, of hospital groups and i would argue that was largely irrelevant to anything uh, really that was mostly around just reorganization for the sake of it uh, and you can I probably might be quoted on that. Who knows? Anyway, so so again, uh, so so adaptation and transformation. There's there's that tension between the two, um, uh, which I think is quite uh, interesting there. But that's not the end of the story. And and I realised as as the project finished, and I always felt very pleased with myself. That was a good project. I really enjoyed that. That actually we hadn't pinned resilience down there was more going on and it comes back to this whole issue of legacy and change and the new normal being different so here we are going through the crisis uh, with the numbers of the human resources in the healthcare sector uh, and and we can see here the red showing the community level and the blue showing the acute hospital uh, resourcing and the, the community falls further and it recovers slower so that even at the end of this period of March 1918, we still don't have community human resources back to where they were in 09. And we've had a switch towards the more acute care, even though all the policy programs over this time were saying community care, community care, community care, move things out of hospitals. So it was interesting. There was there was a differential recovery and there was a change that there was going on, even when the policy said differently. So that was an interesting legacy, if, if you like, uh, from uh, around um, austerity there. The other one was actually, well, Ireland's always had quite high waiting lists and quite, quite long waiting times. But what's actually interesting here is it was only after austerity was over, after we'd recovered, we we're putting money back into the system, that suddenly our waiting list went up. So it was almost like there was pent up demand, or it was almost like, um, you, you, you know, uh, you know, as we'd taken so much out of the, the system and people weren't referring through, maybe they were delaying the refill. So when that started, you know, suddenly our waiting list and waiting times went through the roof. But that only happened after. Um, and this was in a, in a, in a time when, when the government was trying to put, you know, quite reasonable amounts of resources back into the health system uh, again. Um, and the third key legacy issue, I think, was uh, around slodge care. And uh, this was, this is, this is, and this is government policy now, a 10 year plan for health reform devised through political consensus. Uh, and so this is around universal health care. Ireland has never had universal health care. It's one of the few countries in Western Europe never to have that. But what was interesting, this is a direct legacy of austerity, uh, because out of the austerity years, there was suddenly quite a, a shake up in the political landscape. We didn't have populism. I thank God we do not have populism in Ireland. We're one of the few countries that doesn't really have it. But we did have quite a turmoil uh, in our political setup. We had a minority government, but actually what it created was more collaboration and consensus rather than sort of, you know, the, the traditional, um, you know, the table tennis of uh, politics of, of opposition. And actually it allowed the politicians to come together and work on a health plan that everybody could buy into. And that was particularly, I think, a legacy of the austerity era. So we could see maybe two not good uh, legacies, but then this this actually created a different set of, of, of conditions, which is quite in interesting. And then, so the government, I mean, it's been a bit slow on bringing Solange Care forward, but nevertheless, it, it, it's now kind of ramping it up, looking at increasing entitlement to care, bringing in, uh, integrated care models, bolstering the, the, the funding and pushing forward with an implementation office. So that's, that's, that's um, if you like, a good legacy. So all this then got me thinking that actually before I hadn't really got to the heart of health system 
resilience. And I need you to think about it slightly differently. And this is where the European Observatory Policy Brief comes in, which is a culmination of this reflection process. And it wasn't what we'd done before was wrong. It just didn't quite get all of it uh, to, together. So my new thinking on, on, on health system resilience really focuses on a shock cycle. And resilient health systems are those that are able to manage well each stage of the shock cycle. So health system resilience is the ability to prepare for, identify, manage, which includes absorption, adaptation and transformation, and then recover and learn from and deal with the legacy uh, from the shocks to improve the health system performance. So, so you've got a dynamic going on where one shock will naturally bleed into the next. So, you know, so our recovery, our learning, our dealing with the legacy will deal, will create then the preparedness and the ground for what comes next. And the other aspect, I think, uh, is that sometimes uh, the, the resilient response depends on where you are in the shock cycle. And this is why it's sometimes quite difficult to, to compare systems because they may be going through different stuff at different times. So your resilient response depends well where am i am i am i in a preparedness mode or am i in shock impact mode or am i in recovery and learning mode but what does it what does it look like and think so your strategies may often relate to particular aspects that's what i thought anyway but i mean what's quite in interesting as we, as we take the, the, the this forward is that's partly true and partly not true as i found out but anyway we'll move on um so here we have the, the just the, the link there to the work that we did um, that I led with the European Observatory uh, on strengthening health systems uh, resilience. And, and actually, we were ready to go with this report in February of last year, you know, it'd been three, three years of work, about to press the button, and then COVID came and boom. So we had to desperately rewrite everything and put it, try and add in lots of COVID uh, examples and think about it differently. And, and anyway, so I'm sure it was enhanced for it. So we got some early COVID learnings in there. Um, but one of the things that, that we did was just to try and isolate what are the strategies for building health system resilience and we did a rapid review of metrics and strategies where actually i'm actually just as a sidebar i'm now starting off a five-year program looking at health system re resilience and, and actually we're going to you know update this rapid review into a full systematic review we're also doing a realist review of legacy issues from austerity into covid but anyway that's so the, those are those are other things that, that we're now starting off on but uh, we did a rapid review of the metrics we looked at uh, 16 peer review articles in nine grey literature documents and tried to categorize them into the building blocks uh, of the WHO health system functions. And we looked across all uh, all countries, all different kinds of, of shocks. We, we weren't precious. So we were looking at Ebola, SARS, we were looking at um, climate events um, and of course austerity itself. And basically we came up then with these 13 different strategies for building health system resilience, which seem to be pretty much in common uh, across all the different kinds of, of shocks. Now, obviously, there are shock specific strategies because, you know, uh, but, uh, but they're quite diverse, but we were trying to just build up a, a sort of a, a commonality of different strategies that could be useful. Uh, and the key focus, you know, clearly on governance and financing. I, I mean, and maybe I'm an, an economist, I could be biased here. So, but certainly from, from our experience of COVID governance has been incredibly important. So the bit things that, and, and they kind of make sense when you, when you see them in the light of COVID, effective and participatory leadership with strong vision, coordination of activities, an organizational learning culture, that's easy to say, isn't it? And difficult to, to do as our governments are, are now finding uh, with the re repeated failures of our of our leaders but anyway uh, effective information uh, systems and flows and obviously s surveillance uh, with financing i think it, it's largely around ensuring there's enough and that you can uh, adjust it quickly and if you just happen to have some counter cyclical healthcare financing or a reserve stash all the better although that may not be the end of the day i think uh, in in the current uh, climate and um uh, because of the because of the, of the way that the, the finances international finance is, is organized at the moment and then having comprehensive healthcare is just incredibly handy because you you're not you you're then guaranteeing that the people can get care even even 
even if their own uh, economic circumstances are in difficulty. The, the other things that come across things like uh, appropriate surge capacity is vital, motivated and well supported workforce. Again, that's that's that seems utterly critical uh, and easy to to forget. And then all the innovation through alternative and flexible approaches to delivering healthcare. So we have the, these 13 different strategies came out. And I think they're obviously interesting to, to see how well they've been done. And what we tried to do also is to try and relate the different strategies to different stages of the shock cycle. And some of them are actually there throughout, although obviously again, they might be worked out in different ways. And some of them do relate to, to, specific, to specific stages and, and specific parts. Um, so, for instance, if we look at the uh, the financing elements here, there's obviously a big focus on shock on shock impact and management. And and let's face it, it's when the shock hits that most of the focus is. It, 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 it's not often on the you know the preparedness gets some get some research. The recovery and learning often doesn't get any, um, you know, because people have just moved on to, to other problems and and, and other things uh, in, in their lives. But particularly around financing, the importance of getting the the health system funded funding to count cyclical health financing mechanisms or the rainy day fund or whatever it is, and then having purchasing flexibility and, and reallocation of funding to meet changing needs is incredibly important. Um, then around uh, resources and service delivery, again, uh, again, you know, stage three is incredibly important, but there's lots that can be done before that. And actually having the motivated and well-supported workforce is something that came out very strongly, whichever shock uh, you're in, if your people are able to go the extra mile, then it just makes uh, all the difference. So it was all of that. So that's the sort of general framework that we picked up and we drew out of the lessons and, and learning uh, from doing our, our review. But I think it's useful now also just to just to reflect a little bit on COVID uh, and on where we, we've been and where we're going. So um, I think that this, this chart always uh, comes to mind when I think of COVID. Now, I might not have got the year right because, uh, I mean, certainly for the European Commission at the moment, 2021 is, is proving to be a particular banana skin uh, of, of a year with its uh, terrible flat-footed diplomacy. And, and suddenly we might be getting into vaccine wars. So that's, uh, it's, it, it's not good uh, from a Brussels perspective. Um, so let's look at, at COVID. So really, I think the interesting thing about COVID is it's not it's not a once in a generation shock. It's not even a once in a lifetime shock. It's a once in a in a sort of 100 years, once a century shock. And therefore, it becomes very complex how you how you deal with it. And the challenges of governance are that much more severe. So and, and, and we can see the, the four different elements here. So, of course, you've got your daily uh, new confirmed cases, and as you can see, we shot um, shot through the roof in, in around about and around about January the eighth, actually, which is my birthday. Uh, so that was happy birthday. Um, so we got very, you know that was the, 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 there's that initial burden, but there are also the other burdens. So the uh, the, the, the sort of t t top right here, the mental health impact, and particularly now that we've been in these never ending lockdowns, and we're seeing seventy five percent of young adults saying that they're negatively affected by uh, by uh, COVID. And only 32% of old people. So I thought that was quite that was quite impressive, actually, from old people, particularly many who are, who have had to cocoon over this last year, including my, my parents and my in-laws. Um, uh, the, the third element of the burden, I guess, is on the normal care delivery and, and the displacement and the crowding out that, that, that's been going on. And what we see here is the bump uh, that happened around waiting lists. And they, they shot up quite rapidly on the, on the early stages of, of, of COVID. And this is even with, when no one's presenting, because really, to be honest, people drop, stopped going, stopped getting uh, referred. But a lot of care was was basically frozen and has been frozen over the last year. A lot of elective care has had to be delayed. And there are obviously uh, well, there are two things. Elective care ha has been delayed, but people are just not getting diagnosed, not getting screened. So there's a that, that itself will probably have a massive impact. And we're not quite sure exactly what that looks like yet. But we can see this early bounce down in the in the uh, bottom left. And then the, the final component really, I think, is the is, of course, the the economic hit. So 
we went into technically a recession uh, in 2020 because our first two quarters were negative growth. We bounced back, but obviously the, the, that has a, a profound impact on a lot of people. Now, probably around 20 to 25% of the workforce would be receiving some kind of pandemic unemployment benefit. So, so you've got these four particular burdens in this sort of mega shock of COVID, which creates then such the, the big um, governance uh, ch challenge. Um, okay, so, so let's look at some of those, those uh, key issues around governance, financing, resourcing and service delivery to see what, what are some of the, the early lessons. Um, and, and I come back to this point about the, you know, the, the being resilient is actually managing well each stage of the shock cycle and the dangers of overconfidence just because you do one bit right doesn't mean that the next bit goes well. And actually what we've seen hugely in the UK and Ireland is the danger of governance not getting it right. Uh, in the UK, we had we're well prepared. The UK was well prepared on, according to the Global Health um, Index. It was one of the most prepared uh, health systems for a, a pandemic. It's just the flu. They locked down late. Huge numbers of people uh, got sick and died as a consequence of that overconfidence. Now, some say now that they're making good with the vaccines, uh, but the, the, the dangers of, 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 of not being vigilant, having to be resilient at each stage, if you like. Uh, but with Ireland, we, we did the same. We had not a bad 2020. There's a chart here which shows the daily confirmed COVID cases. Uh, it compares Ireland to, to Canada. You did a bit better. Um, but what we did uh, was, was we managed to, you know, three lockdowns and we said, sure, you can have Christmas, not a problem. You don't say that to Irish people. You don't say you can go to the pub now. <laughs> really, this is the impact. We got the highest rate of infection in the world. And that is Guinness speaking. You know, OK, OK, there's the UK variant as well. But basically, that's letting people go to the pub. So, again, the, just dropping the, the, the vigilance, um, actually, the, the huge impact of that. And actually, still, the rate of, of COVID cases is still quite high. And, and there's real tensions now about what to do do with that and of course as we know you know the dominic cummings story drives 260 miles for you know he's a dominic cummings the, the health the advisor to to boris johnson drives 260 miles to get childcare, takes a, a sick whatever it is a 50 mile round trip to a local beauty spot to test his eyes for the reverse journey the importance of integrity and trust building and communication is absolutely critical. And what's interesting here is not that somebody's lambasting Dominic Cummings, but it is the Daily Mail, which is about as right wing as they come and would be staunch government supporting. So if the Daily Mail says it, you know you have a, a problem. And we can, I'm sure we can think of uh, uh, loads of of examples of our own and what that does is it just changes behavior it, it breaks the kind of social contract which is so essential to taking everyone with you and then you know results in um, terrible uh, consequences for everybody the one thing as an economist i would say is um and that this is coming through quite strongly i think is spend this is absolutely the time to spend money. There should be no thought of, of austerity. Now, the Irish economy is not doing too badly. We bounce back in quarter three. We have lots of multinationals. They employ lots of people. We have a rainy day fund. We've learned from our previous austerity era. OK, we'd actually, you know, our economy, our tax base is more diversified. It, we're just in a better shape. But I think, and, 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 and that's in more true for Ireland than some other countries, but other, I mean, it's interesting the Baltics have actually also learned from their previous austerity and, and made things better. But I think what we are experiencing, uh, particularly in the EU, is that actually the, our, our borrowing rates are so low at the moment compared to where they were. So back in, in 2012, we had borrowing rates, what, you know, over 12% up here. I mean, appalling. Now they are half a percent. So actually, the 10 year bond rate, you know, is so low, we can just basically let's just print money. You know, let's just finance this to get through this particular shock because we can, you know, uh, we, we really don't have a problem of, of the cost of borrowing like we did have. And our debt, debt to, to GDP ratio in Ireland, it, it, it was fantastic. It then became terrible. 
we're now around 60 percent and and actually i would say probably up to about 80 90 percent you've still got a fair bit of trust in you this is for normal small economies of course if if, if you're into the us it, you know the normal rules do not apply but normal normally uh, people will say yeah up to about 80 90 percent you're okay we're good we're we trust you. So there's a bit of latitude to, to borrow right now. So so I'm, I'm starting to hear the clarion calls of, of austerity. And again, I think that's exactly the wrong thing that we should be doing at this stage. I think it's going to be incredibly counterproductive. And one of the reasons why I, I say that is actually the response to COVID in Ireland has been to make big investments in healthcare. And that's not just big investments to cope with COVID. It's actually big investments to to deal with the structural problems. So actually what we see here, uh, we had initial funding around 450 million. We then had a winter plan around 600 million, but we then have had 4 billion, 20% increase year on year shoved into the health budget. Half of that is for COVID, but half of it is actually addressing key structural issues. And this is where my understanding, I think, of transformative resilience is changing. So it's not just about transformative resilience to deal with the problem. It's actually transforming my health sector through this and using this as a, as, as a time, a window, if you like, of, 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 of opportunity, a time when the normal resistance isn't there to spending in key key areas stakeholders are, are more compliant if i put my policy wonk ha hat on here this is a great time to transform to spend to transform and i think probably effective governments will transform through this you know if they can work out the, the, the you know to, to deal with some of those structural problems which will then allow us to continue this launch care reform program forward that we, we wanted to and, and just to say that really, I think, the, and I've just borrowed this slide from, from John Silas, so my apologies and my thanks to him. John is based at the European Observatory and, and at the London uh, School of Economics. Uh, and how does the IMF expect economies to fare? Yeah, not bad. You know, we are bouncing back. We will have unemployment. It will be a key issue, but there's quite a lot of bounce back here. So again, I think it's not the time to be thinking about austerity that will only deepen the uh, crisis when actually we need to be we need to be much more keynesian in our approaches i, I think looking at human uh, the sort of human resources um lots of european countries um created surge capacity by doing different things so they responded by trying to bring human resources out of the woodwork uh, if you like nursing students volunteers retired inactive you know sometimes importing our way uh, out of the, the the problem or just modifying the deployment of existing hr and uh, what's interesting is that the same numbers of countries didn't provide as much support often so actually whatever is 45 countries doing all this deployment not as many countries providing mental support financial support child care and other i think there's been a big mismatch a real imbalance there and i don't think there's been sufficient protection of human resources and health workers through this whole crisis there's a big you know we're quite happy to to take them for granted to, to deploy them but much less effort i think devoted to giving um uh, financial support for instance uh, even if it's just a one-off thank you payment for people going above and beyond the call of duty so that, i think that's a key a key imbalance we've we've kind of tried to adapt to our, our system but in a sense we've taken for granted our, our, our human resources and where we've kind of like tried to import our way uh, historically out of particular problems and europe has a very high reliance on foreign trained doctors i wonder if we've actually increased our our, our vulnerability rather than our resilience the vulnerability of the people themselves if they're on slightly different working conditions and not treated as well which they often aren't uh vulnerability for the health system itself depending on how engaged those th those people are uh, and obviously a vulnerability for for health systems who who've lost scarce health professionals that, that, that they that they uh, couldn't afford to to lose so i think there are issues i think a lot of key issues around how the health workforce is handled and and we, we haven't really come out, out of covid that well on this issue i think and then the other thing i would just say on the service delivery element about what we've seen is is massive smart adaptation uh, in many countries so obviously the increased use of virtual treatments the telemedicine fantastic adaptation and that is a legacy issue now that will stay with us you know who who knew 
the GPs could could do telemedicine so well so easily. We didn't, they didn't, and yet we did it in three weeks. You know, so I think that and that kind of that kind of how the shock creates a, a sort of an energy and it and it knocks down all the normal rules. So I think that's been a very interesting adaptation the, the lesson. And and in other areas too, how do we deal with surge capacity? How do we deal with prioritization and rationing and coming up with different ways of, of adapting uh, into this particular area? So that I think that's been very um uh, constructive. I'm gonna actually I'll, I'll just uh, skip over that slide because I realize that we're, we're moving on a bit um, and I'll, I'll just come in, in into land now. Um, I think in, in many ways health systems resilience is summarized by this cake. Um, uh, I actually one of my lockdown pleasures was lot was in watching Great British Bake Off where they always create amazing things, you know, from very little ingredients. And I always like the celebrity version because the celebrities are really bad at it and it makes me feel better. But I love this cake because even the texturing is really interesting, isn't it? I mean, how did they do that? How did they get that texturing on the cake? Anyway, but in a way, it sums up resilience that, that, that actually w there is the potential, strangely, in the middle of this terrible thing to produce something that, that so we produce something that's good so it's almost like cake out of toilet paper and i want to take that analogy too far though so we'll go down the wrong road anyway so i think really um some of my takeaway messages uh then are you know you really need to think a little bit about the shock and how and the causal pathways of, of the shock and the specific the specific flavor of it i have mixed feelings on on preparedness um because I think you can get away with it if you're not prepared. And sometimes preparedness le re leads you down the wrong avenue because you can be wrongly specified for a shock. And also it can make you a little bit overconfident about your system. And then there's the lack of vigilance that we've seen. So, so preparedness is, is obviously useful, but it, it's, uh, you know, it's certainly not sufficient. And I, I, and I think sometimes people think it is uh, because it's something that people think that you can do at your leisure but i think there are there, there, there are traps there and perhaps because of the diversity of different shocks this is no time for austerity there's cheap credit out there please spend um transformation is uh, is it happening all the time we see fantastic innovation going on around telemedicine but also this is the time for structural reform strangely enough and, 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 I, and I think that's that's a, a really smart piece of legacy building, of system building that we can do in or around th this time. Uh, and I think also we need to take a long, hard look at our workforce protection and motivation. I think we've probably failed uh, in many countries and in many cases. So really, I, I just wanted to end up on, on this note. I, I, my, I've been watching Bake Off. I have three college age daughters who've been uh, watching bad movies. Now I'm sure Sharknado is a fantastic movie, but, but you know, uh, it, but what it made me think about, you know, oh, what's the next shot going to be? Sharks falling from the sky? Probably not. But in essence, as we emerge from COVID, we've got to be thinking, well, what are we building for the future and what, how prepared are we going to be for whatever is coming next? And, and if we're wise, we can hopefully you know, uh, move into sort of a uh, build more resilience and build uh, some good legacy aspects if we're conscious of that at this time. So I think I've, I've waffled on long enough there and I think I probably need to stop and I will stop sharing. There we go. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. And uh, <laughs> thank you for keeping us engaged and entertained on uh, Monday afternoon. It was just just so much to unpack there. So yeah, I'm going to lots in, it. Uh, lots in it for sure. So uh, please feel free to put a raise your hand or type your question in the chat and I will come to you. We have a few minutes for questions. Um, you also have some fan uh, for Sharknado, some Sharknado fans in the in the chat. So just to let you know that. Um, so I'm going to go to Victoria and then Michael. Go ahead, Victoria. You can come off mute and ask your question. Oh, great. Thank you. That was an amazing talk, Steve. I really enjoyed it. Um, I was just wondering about the role of community engagement throughout these resilience phases. You spoke about the cycles that we're in. And in the resilience literature, you don't really see a lot about where we can engage communities to build resilience or tap on community resilience. Could you speak a little bit about where you think that those processes could slide in or whether it's like a separate thing? 
Just curious. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it, it, that's a very good point. I'm probably the last person to to, to speak a, about it because I'm one of these sort of megalomaniac uh, economists who only deals with high falutin things. So um, I, I think it's obviously that there are, you know, there is gold in them, there are hills. There's loads of resources that can be mobilized. The question might relate to which specific shock you're looking at. Um, so I think, uh, you know, uh, what and what kind of community capital you have, what are the existing infrastructures that you could utilize that may be resources that you could release into looking at various different things. And I think we've been quite bad, despite Ireland having quite a good NGO sector and quite a good voluntary sector, we haven't really engaged it, but we have quite a lot of social capital, we have a lot of social support there. Um, uh, and, and, you know, and whether that's community empowerment, maybe it's dealing with, with issues like isolation, you know, during COVID, um, uh, maybe it's, it's to do with, you know, I don't know, giving resource and support for those who, who are, who are having to, to, to isolate. I think there are lots of resources that could be impacted there. I haven't seen much on it. So I think it is an untapped resource because I think it's flexible and I think it's, in existence and you don't have to drum it up from somewhere but i think i mean i certainly know here in ireland our government did rather poorly in relation to unleashing that and, and everything got draped in red tape and, and it was just um, a mess so so i i think it's a very interesting area um but i haven't seen it done well great michael over to you Thanks, Steve. That was a really great talk. Um, so I, I was really intrigued by your use of um, complex systems, uh, I guess, of framing to to sort of think about shocks. But one of oh, the cat. Oh, the cat. Too, uh, yeah. <laughs> I thought um, it was a, but, a shark coming in. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I know. Right. It's hard to tell sometimes. Uh, but I, it, it got me thinking a bit about your shock cycle. And it, it, that seems quite well suited for sort of a shock at a time, but sort of given the sort of impending threat of climate change and all sorts of potential other shocks that could happen concurrently, uh, have you thought a bit about how, you know, how your your sort of framing might work with in a system of shocks, or is it is it mm, better to mm, just think mm, about mm. one one dimension at a time and deal with them separately? Does that make sense? I, it yeah, just, no, it does. It does. I mean, it, it depends how clever you, you are, I guess, Michael. <laughs> if you're very clever, you can probably not, not handle very. all so that. <laughs> I mean, one and one of the things that I was interested to to think about is whether actually there are within COVID there are lots of little shocks going on, uh, or uh, sequentially or concurrently. So that's what I was trying to get at with the, the, the sort of the four elements of it, and and I think there is another level uh, going on in there. Uh, and therefore where your focus needs to shift, because can you handle all of it at the same time? And that's the, one of the big issues. Probably not. Um, it probably works better for discrete shocks. I mean, I, I have to say, when I was preparing some of the shock cycle stuff, um, I was thinking about, well, what is the next shock going to be? And, it, and, it's, and I thought it's going to be Brexit, isn't it? It's going to be Brexit for Ireland, the Irish economy. And that's like dwarfed now. So, so I, I actually didn't, I'm only now understanding that actually you can get a load of shocks happening very either uh, concurrently or in quite short order. So I think there is some thinking to be done about that complexity and I don't have the answers, but I'm happy to dialogue. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And then maybe just do one quick final uh, question um, and it's on the recovery and learning cycle which I agree with you, I think is the most important. I think we put far too much emphasis on preparedness and not to recover and learn. And I personally am very worried about the differential recovery of COVID. I mean, we had a differential mm. impact and I think mm. the differential recovery is going to be uh, pretty frightening actually. And um, so, so I think that the recovering and learning could be a, a big part in mitigating that. So my question is, how do we get that recovering and learning cycle up and running? Do we have to incentivize it? Do we have to make it mandatory? Why is it always, why is it so hard? And how do we actually make, get it a priority for governments and policymakers? I mean, obviously, I, I think there's an, an advocacy question and there's a framing question. What we were able to do through austerity by 
putting out this kind of uh, of research was to frame the narrative, to frame the discussions, you know, that politicians were having. So some of these elements and some of these charts got into the discourse, and I and I think that's what you need to do. You, you, you need to you need to pump out the subject. Okay, th this is how you look at it. This is why recovery is so important because actually we we can change our health system for the better at this time if we're smart and, and we act quick now. So there's a real opportunity now, rather than everyone saying, "Phew, phew it's over. Let's go and relax and, and you know go to the pool or, or something." Actually, if you can actually show you know it, it, put the policy wonk hat on and say there is an opportunity here to fundamentally deal with some structural issues and then get a couple of kind of policy entrepreneurs in or a couple of key people who can speak it out and you frame the discourse i think i think that's going to create a lot of buying because i mean i mean i don't know about politicians on your side of the of, of the pond but here they're looking for ideas you know what's my next idea what's the latest thing i can get that i can really work with so if you frame this i think it could be really uh, attractive absolutely well, we are at time and uh, just conscious of people might have other places to go and you uh, have to probably prepare for bed. Um, I've got my PJs just, on. <laughs> you've got your PJs on. Um, I want to sincerely thank you so much for joining us. It was a fantastic talk. Uh, you gave us a lot to think about. We could talk for quite a long time and I hope you are still doing that sabbatical uh, in Toronto at some point when it's safe to do so and again. So maybe we can uh, welcome you in 3D. That would be great. I look forward to it. And thank you, everyone. Enjoyed thank you it. again, everyone, for joining. I put the link for next week. We have Dr. Yukari Hori uh, talking to us about um, climate impacts on Northern Road. So I hope you can enjoy it and join us for that. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great evening. Good night, Stephen. Cheers. Bye. See you now.